Hey guys, Carl from Performance Place. Today I'm going to be taking a look at Pantheon. This is the third game I'm taking a look at in the 18 Hex series from Little House Board Games that's going to be hitting Kickstarter tomorrow if you catch this video when it's going live. This is a sort of head-to-head -head battler, area control, spatial puzzler of a game that also happens to have a solo automa or AI included as well. Disclaimer, I was given a copy of these three games from the publisher for these videos, but as always, I will do my best to give you my own honest opinions on the games. With that said, let's head down to the table to see how the solo mode in this one plays, and then I'll meet you back up here to let you know what I think. To set up a solo game of Pantheon, begin by finding this coin tile, giving it a flip, and setting that out in the center of the table. You'll then take note of the colored hexes, both here at the top and here on the sides shuffling the rest of the tiles, and then placing out three tiles that match those colors. So we're going to place one white tile at the top here like this, and then two black tiles at the two lower sides like this. Then off down here in the bottom corner, we will place the rest of the tile stacked like this, and finally, to finish that up, place out two more tiles to the left and right of the stack. Having done that, I'm going to shift this over just a bit so we have some space away from the tile stacks, but I can move things around and zoom out or in as needed while playing. So Pantheon, as the name might suggest, is a sort of head-to-head -head battle game between the two pantheons of gods, both Greek and Roman. And you'll see that each of these tiles is actually double-sided with the same god and the same abilities and the same scoring and so on on both sides, except that one is the Greek version of the god and one is the Roman version of the god. So here we see Ceres, and on the Greek side we see Demeter. But otherwise it's exactly the same god, same number, same logo, same ability, and same scoring at the bottom like that. Pantheon is going to play out over a series of rounds where I and the AI will be taking turns, placing out tiles, and the game will play out until all of the tiles in these stacks have been played out onto the table. And on a given turn, we are going to be able to choose either this left tile or this right tile to place out on the board. Whoever has the coin tile in their color at any given point also has the option of choosing this top tile. Now for myself, I can choose either left or right and the center tile should this be switched to my color because white, the Greek side, will always be the AI's color. But the AI is going to choose a tile based on the number showing on the top of this tile stack. So with an odd number, they will choose the left tile. With an even number, they will choose the right tile. And should they have control of the coin in the middle, if this number should happen to fall between these two numbers, which it does right now, they will instead choose to place that center tile. And I'm going to be able to place the tile anywhere I'd like to on the tableau, activating whatever the ability is showing there, keeping in mind the scoring condition at the bottom of the tile. And the AI player is going to place their tile based on a sort of priority list based on the symbol that's printed on the tile that they are playing. And then they will activate the ability again following a sort of priority list that explains which tiles are interacted with and so on. So let me go over several of the different pieces of iconography that you see. First off, the scoring in this game is going to score based on the final tableau, whatever's left at the end of the game. And we'll go through sort of tile by tile scoring what that tile scores. Some tiles are going to be like this tile right here that are simply going to score a sort of fixed number of points if that tile is in your color. Some tiles are going to be scoring based on adjacency. This one will score one point for every tile that it's adjacent to, either white or black. But some of them, like this tile right here, will only score points if it's next to a specific color, in this case black. And that's true on both sides. This doesn't match the color of the tile. That's just the scoring condition for this tile. Another common scoring system that you will see is this one right here. And these are all sort of weapons. 
you will score a number of points based on the number of weapons you have in your color at the end of the game. So if I have one weapon showing this kind of scoring at the bottom, I'd score one. Two would be three, three would be seven, and four would be 10 points. And you'll see already here that this is another one of those tiles that we could potentially, if I place this as my color, would be my second one, scoring me three points. There are a few other scoring conditions that will come out as I play through, and I'll point those out as they come out. But for right now, the last one I want to talk about right now is this coin in the center. Whoever owns the coin at the end of the game will simply score three points. Whoever does not own the coin at the end of the game is going to score one point per, per tile in their color in the largest connected area of that color. So if you own the coin, you're trying to sort of separate out the other players tiles, and if you don't, you really want to put all your tiles as close together as possible to score on that sort of area scoring. So as mentioned before, because the AI has this coin in their color, they will be playing first. Normally with an odd number, they would be taking the left tile, but because nine fits between 13 and five, they will be placing this tile. So the first thing I want to do, actually, you know what, before I do that, let me explain some of the different abilities. The ability you see on this tile that's about to be placed and this tile right here is the flip tile ability. If I play this down, I will choose one tile adjacent to this tile and flip it to the other side. This ability will allow me to choose one tile that's adjacent to this tile and switch it with any other tile on the sort of playing area. This one will allow me to choose a tile that it's adjacent to this one, moving it one space either into a different empty location or playing it on top of another tile, covering that other tile, preventing that other tile from being scored at the end of the game. Only condition with this is you can never cover the coin tile with any other tile. In addition, when moving a tile, you can never separate any tile from the Pantheon. Everything must always be connected as one large piece. And the final tile ability is this one right here. And this is simply a copy ability. So it's just going to copy the ability of one of the tiles that's adjacent to this tile when it gets played. All right, so let's go ahead and take the first AI turn. And then hopefully as I play through the game, anything that's not quite clear will become clearer. So we're going to take this tile for the AI. And I'm going to check the AI sort of priority list for this trident symbol. And this trident symbol is one of the weapon symbols, so it says that. First, I want to make sure that this tile gets placed next to both white and black, and then I want to place it adjacent to more of my tiles, more black tiles than white tiles. So the only place I can place this that is next to more black tiles than white tiles and touches a white tile is this location right here. So they're gonna slot that in right there. And then we've got the flip icon. The flip icon says that because the center tile, which was this one, was an odd number, it's going to aim for low numbers. So it wants to activate the flip effect on an enemy tile with a lower number. So lower than nine would be four. So it's going to flip this tile over to the other side. All right, then my turn. Now you'll see all of these tiles are white. That doesn't matter because as I said, they're all double-sided. So whichever one I take, I can simply flip to the other side. So I want to take this 13, which lets me move a tile, or this five, which lets me copy an ability and wants to be next to other tiles. Hmm. I'm going to take this five and I'm going to place it here like this. Oh, sorry, it should be my tile. Place it here like this flipping this one to the other side like that. And now again, this score is based on adjacency to other black tiles, so I will want to try and flip other tiles near it to score more points near the end of the game. All right, then, again, the AI's turn. They still have the coin. This seven falls between six and 13, so they're gonna take that. All priorities are going to be based on odd numbers. I'm looking at this flower. And the flower says I want to place it adjacent to the ally group containing the most tiles, which there is only one Greek group here. And I want to make sure that it's touching both 
tiles from their civilization and mine. So I got to touch white and black and I need to be adjacent to this, which means here, 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 or here are all valid options. To break a tie then, because it's odd, we're looking for low numbers and I'm going to add all the, all the numbers on the tiles together around each location. So this is 29 here. This is 19 here. This is 14 here and this is 23 here. So they will place their tile right there. This is the moving ability, which for them, they're going to activate again because it's odd, the lower number tile, which is this five. And they want to move that tile so that it will be on top of one of my tiles. So they're going to cover that tile right there. Then my turn. That's not great. In that case, I'm going to try to, yeah, I'm going to take the coin from them. I don't know if that's smart right now. Hold on. Is it smart right now? I don't particularly care. Because if I can keep all my stuff together, I score lots of points for not having the coin. All right, let me do this. I'm going to put that there. That's another weapon. I've got two. If I flip this one with my flip ability, now I've got three weapons, which is great. That moves out. Again, for the AI, still has the coin. Three is between two and 13, so they're placing out. This one here, another weapon, Ares. Looking at the weapon priorities, the same as what we saw before. Has to touch both colors. More black than white is good. Means the best location for it is here. Touching two black and one white. It's trying to flip based on an odd number again, because that came from the center stack. It's trying to flip a number lower than it. It can't. So it's going to try and flip the, my tile above that number. And whenever there's more than one, it will always pick the one that's closer in number. So this one's going to get flipped over like that. All right, my turn. Uh, here's another one of the special ones. Now this is a bit of a mistake because this symbol should actually be on Hercules and Hercules' lightning bolt should actually be on this tile, but that's okay. This one is actually going to score minus four points for whoever has it if it's not adjacent to Hercules. And this is actually going to let me flip two tiles or let a person flip two tiles, which is pretty cool. But again, it doesn't score you anything and it could potentially give you minus points, which is even worse. All right, so I've got either copy ability or moving. Ah, this is another funny score. This one scores you four points if Hercules is not visible at the end of the game. So something has to be covering Hercules for Juno or Hera to score in this case. So if I took that one, I'd want to try my best to cover Hercules. But since he's mine and he's scoring for me, I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to take this one, which just scores a flat four points, and it's going to let me move something to another place or cover something. And let's see what we've got. All right, why not? I'm going to take this right here and I'm going to move my own tile to cover up this four points like that. All right. AI's turn 12 is not between 2 and 11. 12 is even, so they're going to take the tile on the right side. And again, we saw this flower before, means they want to be closest to their biggest grouping, which is here anyway, there's only one, and it needs to be adjacent to both colors, which means it has to be here or here. And we're even, so we're looking for bigger numbers. This is 29, this is nine, so it will get placed right there. And it's going to copy the ability, and when it's an even number, it's copying the high numbered tile or the tile that's numbered higher than it. The coin is always the lowest number. So we've got a 15 and a 14. And this is a copy and you can't copy a copy. So it's going to copy the flip. And because it's even, it wants to flip. And well, it doesn't matter. It wants to flip enemy anyway. So this gets flipped over like that. All right. Then this gets placed out like this. 
only tile I can take. Well, I could take either of those two. But Jupiter needs to be next to Hercules. And the only way to do that is to put it here or here right now. And this flips two tiles, and I'd only be flipping one. Means this one lets me move something on top of something else, which I don't really want to do right now. So, and I can't take this one, so I am going to take this one actually. And I am going to place it next to something. It doesn't really matter here or here for me, so I'm going to place it right there. That way it is next to Hercules, and I am going to flip over this one right here like that. It's a wasted double flip, but it is what it is for right now. 16 is not between 8 and 12, but it's even, so they're going to take this one. Eros says that with the heart symbol I'm trying to find next to the biggest white group, which is that already, and next to both white and black. So here or here, even number means higher. This is 15, this is 9, so it is going to get placed there. Like that, and it's moving something. Now we're looking at even, so it wants to move something higher than it, which is this 13 or this 14. And it's going to choose the one closest, so it's going to move this 13. And it wants to move this 13 on top of one of my tiles, which could be here or here. And the tiebreaker here is clockwise or counterclockwise. In this case, based on an even number, it will be clockwise. So moving from here around the circle, it's going to cover up that one like that. All right, my turn. Ooh, I like that actually. Yeah, I'm gonna take. Oh, that's not a. That's a swap. Never mind. Ooh, that's even better. But I can't get it. I gotta hope that. Oh. Let's see what we got out here. Yeah, it's about even, odd and even. I haven't been counting. This is three points per black tiles, which would be huge right now. I want to place. Yeah, I'm going to take this 16 anyway. I'm going to put it there, and now I get to swap two tiles. And I think I'm going to swap. It doesn't matter. Nothing is scoring for adjacency at all anyway. But I can swap this with something else. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to swap those two tiles like that. Because this one scores for white tiles next to it, and there aren't any. So that's cool for me. All right, now we hope for an E. Yeah, perfect. This is an odd number, which means they're not taking this tile. I really want this tile to score lots of points. So problem is it can't swap itself, but we'll make it work. Then they are taking based on odd. 17 does not fit between 8 and 10. They're taking 8. Again, with a heart, they are going to place next to their biggest set, which is this over here, trying to touch both colors. So here, here. And we've got an odd number, so we're going low. That's 15, that's 9. This gets placed down here in the corner. And let me try and move all of this on the screen so we can see what's going on. Like that. He's moving something. And he wants to move something lower. And of course, they'll always pick the one that's closer in number. So they're going to be moving this Hercules. Now, this is not quite clear in the prototype rules. But I'm going to assume that this stack counts as the tile and not this single tile. It could be that this just this top tile is going to move over like this. I'm not sure. So they may actually end up with four points more. I will contact the developer, or the designer, before I post this video to make a clarification, and I will post that below right here as a subtitle. But let's say that it moves like this. Then, my turn. That stinks. Ah, uh, but less so. I'm going to actually take this one, place it there, and flip this guy right here, like that. 
All right, so now we're down to two tiles on the AI's turn. The way this works now is they're going to add up those two numbers and then use that number to determine. So this is even, this is even. Adding them together makes an even number, so we will take the tile on the right for them, which is this fire token, which I was kind of hoping for because it scores based on my tiles, but let's see what happens. Fire wants to be next to both and then next to more white. So there's only ability to be next to more white when it's there. So I want it to be here, 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 here. And we're going even, so it should be biggest. 8, 11, 25. Oh, here we go. 29 is maybe bigger. 28. Yeah, it's going to get placed right there. And it's swapping things. Again, swapping things will always activate on an ally tile and exchange it for an enemy tile now with a higher number because of even number. So it's going to activate this and it's going to swap with an enemy tile that has a higher number. And the higher number that's closest to either of those is this 13. So it's going to swap this 13 and this 2 like that. And then finally, for my final placement, is this tile right here that's going to score me three points. I don't want to put it here because they're scoring based off adjacency to black tiles, and that would be a mistake. So, this gets me three points anywhere. I will put it there because then at least adds two points for that one. Oh wait, hold on, it's copying an ability. It's copying an ability. Then I will put it there. And I'm going to copy, can you see that? Yeah, I'm going to copy this flip. Let me just slide everything just a little bit further up so we can see for real. I'm gonna copy this flip, flipping this tile over like that. And that is the end of the game. So I will score the AI first. It will score just like I do, following the normal scoring rules. We'll start at the top up here. One point for every tile adjacent to this tile is two points. This one is four points if Hercules is covered. He's not. So that doesn't score. This is two points for adjacent is this one. This one gets them three points because they own the coin. This one gets me one point, them one point for adjacent. One, two, three. This one gets them two points for adjacent. White is nothing. They score with a total of ten. And then my turn... I've got one, two, three, four of the weapons, which is 10 points, plus three points here, plus three for adjacent, one, two, three is nine, plus four for that one, plus two for adjacent blacks is two, four, and then the coin gets me one point for every black in that connection is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Make sure that's right, two, four, six, eight points with a total score of 38 to the AI's 10. So that's it for the gameplay. I did manage to quite easily destroy the AI in this game. I will discuss more about how the game plays in just a minute. But first, while we're here, I just want to take a look at the components. Now, this is a prototype for a Kickstarter campaign, so I can't really comment too much on it, except that the artwork here is very nice. I don't know how much of this is created, how much of this is reused. I don't have that information, but everything does look really nicely. It's really cool to me that they're doing this sort of Greek versus Roman idea, and it really does shine through in, in terms of the names. Now, it is a little bit difficult to read the names on some of these black banners when they use the dark writing, so I hope that that gets fixed a bit in the final version of the game, but otherwise I think it looks really cool out on the table. The pictures, the iconography, everything's pretty easy to understand. Right now, the only other thing that does come in the box is this little pamphlet. Now, this is just, again, the Kickstarter prototype, so I don't know what's going to come in the actual box, but this just gives me a little bit of information about the game, and this is a link that takes me to the Kickstarter page. I assume, again, that there might be more in the game. I hope the rules might be in the box, but it could be something that works as a digital rule set, too. I'm not 100% sure on that. Otherwise, the box for this game, at least for the prototype version of the game, is this nice small hex size box. It does fit 
sort of right in the palm of your hand. It's a very nice small size that does sort of just fit the tiles of the game pretty well. I mean, there's a little bit of wiggle room in the box, but not a whole lot. So there's not a lot of wasted space in here. The box, the packaging, I do enjoy the packaging quite a bit. It looks very nice. With all that said, maybe back up top and I'll let you know what I think about the game itself and how the AI works as well. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the playthrough. I do apologize again for that one rules mistake in the middle of the video, but I did leave a comment in the subtitles to explain exactly how it should have been done, and hopefully it didn't really affect the gameplay all that much to matter, and you still got a good idea of how this game plays through. Now, before I tackle this game, there are a couple things that I need to say. Number one, first off, this is still a prototype, and more importantly, the AI rules for the solo mode are definitely still sort of under development and will absolutely change before this game goes published and goes you know, out into the masses. So everything you saw in the solo mode could change and probably will change quite a bit before you get a chance to play the finished version of it. And the reason I say that is because I'm of sort of two minds on the game as it stands right now. The game itself, looking at how the game plays, the mechanisms of the game, is something that really, really, really interests me. If you've watched videos on this channel before, I'm sure you know that I'm a big fan of spatial puzzler games, and this one is a really interesting one, because this plays out a lot like a lot of those sort of hex-based spatial puzzle games where you're slotting in hexes to score based on other hexes that they're connected, and each different kind of hex scores differently based on its placement and what it's adjacent to, and so on. And now these hexes all each have their own powers that influence the hexes around them as they're placed. And that sort of adds to the fun of placing down these tiles. But it's not just a simple tile laying game because in this case as well, it's a head to head battler. So you're not only interested in sort of making the situation as good for you as possible. You're also trying to mess up your opponent and take away scoring opportunities from your opponent as you're playing through as well. And it's even got a little bit of a sort of Othello feel to it with one of the main powers being flipping tiles because not only do you want to make sure that the tiles are placed in good places to score, you also need to make sure that those tiles are showing your side so that you get the points for them at the end of the game. So there's this whole idea of laying down tiles in the right place to score, using abilities to flip tiles to your color so that the scoring tiles are scoring for you and not your opponent but then also thinking about movement of those tiles once they've been placed because there's these sort of move tile and swap tile abilities that will allow you to rearrange that organization of hexes on the table as well. And those rearranging could be swapping things to put your opponent's thing in a bad place and your thing in a good place. But also the movement ability lets you actually start covering up tiles, in which case instead of stealing something from your opponent, if you don't have the ability to take those points for yourself, you could simply just nullify that tile completely and cover over that tile with another tile. And then you saw, I believe it was Hera, has a scoring that scores only when a specific tile is covered over. So you do have to think about how do I best protect tiles that I want to score so that the other person can't move them, can't cover them, can't flip them, but at the same time doing the same thing myself to my opponent's tiles and ultimately trying to figure out the best way to sort of add tiles, move tiles, manipulate tiles, and ultimately score the most points at the end of the game. And then you've got that coin token, which is very interesting to me because if you own the coin, you get three points at the end of the game. If you don't end the game with the coin, you get one point for every tile in your biggest territory. And what that means is if you work real hard to get all of your tiles put together in one big chunk, you could end up scoring a ton unless your opponent starts flipping things or covering things or separating those into smaller areas on the table. But at the same time, if you have the coin, you've got a choice of three tiles every round instead of just two, and then you can start choosing the tiles that you really want, and you've got more options and you've got more ability to do different things every turn. So having the coin during the game is absolutely super helpful. But at the end of the game, if you manage to build a giant area of one color, not having the coin might actually be a good thing. So there's this really cool dynamic of, do I aim for the coin? Do I let my opponent have the coin? So long as I'm doing well with the two tiles on offer, do I really care about the coin? Maybe, maybe not. It's just an extra little wrinkle that's added to the puzzle of the game that I do really enjoy. So this game, as a multiplayer game, I haven't had a chance to play the head-to-head two-player game, 
but I feel like I'm going to really, really, really enjoy this game multiplayer. Now, we come to the solo mode. The solo mode here is going to be tricky regardless of how well it's done, and that's simply because the opponent needs to react to things. The opponent needs to change things in a smart way, not just, again, for its own scoring purposes, but also to ruin my scoring purposes. And developing an AI that's going to make these decisions in the right way, to score the points the right way, and to sort of mess with the, the display in the right manner is going to be very, very tricky. Now, it might require some kind of slight twist on scoring or slight different abilities for the AI to have versus what the player has. I'm not a designer. There's certainly ideas that I've got. I've shared some ideas with the developer. We'll see what happens. But I have high hopes that there is a solo mode in here that will really work. That said, as it stands, I don't know how I feel about the solo. And I say that mostly not because of how it plays, but because of how I keep scoring. I've won every single game of this that I've played. And two or three times I've won by nearly doubling, almost tripling the AI score, which is not something that should be happening and definitely not happening that easily on some of my early plays. So there's definitely some tweaking that needs to happen here with how the AI takes its turn, what the AI is prioritizing, how the AI is moving things around, and ultimately how the AI is scoring at the end of the game to make it sort of more competitive against me as the player. Now, using the AI right now as is to just sort of teach myself the flow of the game and sort of practice against the AI so when I play a two-player game, I think as it stands right now, even that is fine. But there is some work to be done because the other small thing that might bother some, it doesn't bother me so much, is the AI in this is a little bit fiddly. And I think that sort of has to be the case for the AI to make any sense in this game because as I was saying, each tile scores differently, each tile has different abilities, each tile wants to change the world in different ways, but ultimately there's also this sort of overarching way that the tableau or that the, the table display needs to be to score more points for the AI. And for it to continue thinking about these things every time it places a specific tile out, there needs to be a very sort of hierarchical structured decision tree that the AI is following. And what that means is every time I play a tile in this game, I need to check a table because the ability for me to memorize the six, five or six different kinds of tiles and the five or six different responses from the AI is probably not something that it's worth me memorizing because it's easy enough to refer to the, the, the table. And the table uses iconography that's easy enough for me to look at quickly and say, ah, that's what that does. This is what I do. Done. So you got to make sure that you understand going into this. If you're looking at the solo mode for this game, there is this sort of tree of this, then this. If this, then this, then this. This is a tiebreaker kind of decision tree that you're going to need to follow every single turn of the AI. Does it take a long time? No. But it's not something you're going to be able to easily internalize and just play through the game. And it will make the game extend a little bit longer than a regular multiplayer, of, multiplayer game of this game would do. It also means that Every time you make a turn with an AI, it's not a matter of this does this, it's this does this, but if it's an even number, it does this, and if it's an odd number, it does that, and then looking at the tiles around it, it could select this one or this one, and that one's better than this one because of that, but then this one is the better one because of that. And there is a little bit of this sort of if-then sort of decision-making program, basically, in order to figure out what the AI is going to do. So for me, that's not a big deal because ultimately I enjoy what it's trying to do and I kind of understand that that's the kind of system that needs to exist for this AI to make sense at all. But know that that's there and know that if that's not the kind of solo mode that you enjoy, this game will not be for you as a solo mode. But if you don't mind that, crossing my fingers that the designers slash developers make this solo mode a little bit better than what it is right now and make it so that the scoring is competitive and challenging. I really enjoy the sort of core concept of this game. I really enjoy the idea of Roman gods versus Greek gods because they're all based on the same pantheon of gods with different names. So you can sort of just flip over the tile. I thought that's a really clever idea. I like the spatial puzzle battler area control kind of aspect of this game. I'm a big thumbs up except that the solo needs a little bit of work. That's all I've got. I hope that this video was helpful. I hope that you enjoyed what you saw. As always, if you did, I do ask that you like, subscribe, and click the bell icon below, and I'll see you all next time. Ah, one more thing before I run, sorry. The link to the Kickstarter campaign is down below. If you wanna go have a check, 
take a look at the campaign yourself. The other games in the series, I've reviewed two of them already. Go back and check out the videos on those. I'm really excited about what this company is doing, and I definitely look forward to more of these Hex games in the future. Thanks, guys.